Hi there, this is Rachel Baxter, and it's Thursday evening. Um, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I really cannot find a good time to make this video, but I just feel like it's important. And um, so I've got a couple of boys that need to get to bed here soon. You might hear them in the background. Uh, plus, um, who knows what else? So dogs and all kinds of good stuff. So. Um, the purpose of this video is to kind of share what God's put on my heart regarding the, the current events. Um, the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, passed away about a week ago. And so that's been in the news and kind of on the world stage. And so I, I just um, am feeling uh, kind of a, a deep appreciation of God's timing for things, of what He's doing um, the book that I made, that I wrote and published recently called The Revelation of Israel, God's Plan is Our Destiny, which is really about the promises of God that he made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants, but which we're going to see fulfilled in our day. As we're living in the, the last days, in the end times of this reign under Satan and the time that's just ahead of us, the millennial reign of Christ. And so, um, you know, each these things that happen, these significant things that happen that our world takes notice of, such as the passing of the Queen of England, it's important to step back and say, Lord, what are you doing in this? And um, obviously she was old and had lived a good life, good long life, had served uh, as served uh, royalty over um, over two billion people on our planet right now that are underneath the British Commonwealth of Nations. And so in my book, I write about the promises specifically that God made to Joseph and to his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who Joseph received a double birthright. And so it was important and it was like in the last days, this is what will happen. And so we know that those two, the, the nation, the people groups under Ephraim and Manasseh, we'd be able to recognize them. And so um, I write about that in the book and the conclusion that I've come to and so many other um, much more learned people than me uh, have come to is that America, the United States of America is the fulfillment of Manasseh, the promises made to Manasseh and the people of Manasseh and the British Commonwealth of Nations is the promises made to Ephraim. And so along those lines in the book, there was uh, an important piece that I wrote about and it was about the stone of scone or the stone of destiny. And I believe in the next many months leading up to the coronation of King Charles, if it happens, if that's um, what God intends, because God, we know the scripture says that God raises up kings and he causes them to fall. And so it's really, it's God, whether we like it or not, whether we believe um, someone is worthy to be, uh, God has a plan. And so, um, I personally believe that the, the, you know, that Queen Elizabeth and now King Charles, they are a part of that plan. It doesn't mean that they're righteous. It doesn't mean that they're following the Lord, um, but that they are a part of what God is doing on the earth. And so anyway, um, so this scone, the stone of scone, or it was Jacob's pillow. So scriptural references, we'll get into that, but there's just, um, one thing that I really want to talk about tonight, and it's really not um, with my book necessarily, but um, as I've been kind of researching uh, about the stone of destiny and God's promises and what what scripture says about what the stone, you know, the meaning of the stone and what, what just his word says about the plan that God had for King David and Solomon, and then his descendants after him, through the 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 uh, tribe of Judah. So of Israel, Israel's twelve sons. One of them was Judah, and we know that Jesus came from Judah. But there were promises made um, that obviously Jesus fulfilled. But even beyond that, a, a major tenet of the book that I wrote is that as Christians, we oftentimes think times think about the Bible as you know, well, it's God's story. It was like God's rules and, you know, learning about God. And then Jesus came and he fulfilled it all. And so we just need to be saved. We need to believe in Jesus and we're saved. And that's the end of the story. And that I don't disagree that that's all those things are important, but that that's not the end of the story. God wrote 
you know, his the 66 books of the Bible. And then we know there's other supporting books, um, historical words that were written, prophetic words that were written, um, books that aren't on our canonized Bible today that give more insight into some of these things. And so we, we stand on the word of God alone, the Bible, but, um, you know, I, I've just, my heart's been drawn to study out the things of God and, um, and as much, as much as he leads me to. And so anyway, um, there's a particular, non-canonized book called the book of jubilees and so there's just um, some really interesting things and so i go into that a little bit in my book um, but anyway um, when we think about the what god intends to do in the last days and bringing his children back to himself uh, there is a role to play for ephraim and manasseh the descendants of ephraim and manasseh as well as judah so with that said, um, I want to read to you this article that I, that I um, found as I was researching, because I just think it was really well written by a man named Dr. Bob Thiel. Um, but before I do that, let's see if I can, hopefully you guys can see this, and I apologize for whatever dumb ads pop up, but I just wanted to show, um, you know, this is what's kind of in the headlines. This is USA Today. Prince Charles is now King Charles III. Here's what to know about UK's new monarch. And um, the passing of Queen Elizabeth. So after more than 70 years of Queen Elizabeth II's steady reign over the UK. So biblically, 70 years is important. And I, I go into that in my book too. This, these periods of God, 50 years is a jubilee, 70 years, 100 years. Um, that the time of God, you know, the times of God God wrote the end from the beginning. He had a he had this I believe 6000 year plan which we're coming to the end of and we're going to see this millennial reign for a thousand years which is represented the, of the the seven days, the six days of creation, the seventh day God rested. So here we are coming to the end of it. So the 70 years even I think pops out at me. And so um, I'm not going to go into this article but you know if you're watching the news at all this is um, kind of very much front and center. And so what I do want to pull up is uh, let's see if I can, yeah, find this. So this is, um, this website is cogwriter.com. Uh, I think it's the, the church of God, um, is what COG means, the church of God. So anyway, this is just a very well-written article and I just want to step through it. We're not going to read the whole thing, but there's so much really, really good meat here, um, that I don't want us to lose. So, or miss. And so, um, did you realize that when Jesus returns, he will take up the throne of David? So is there a throne or a part of it on the earth now? What about the throne of scone, also called the, called the stone of destiny? So I said in my book, I write about this because as I was writing the Lord, you know, I really felt like I wrote this book with the Lord and um, that it really is his story about his plan and his purposes and the promises that have been fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled. And in there, um, I, I get to talk about, and I share a couple of pictures of um, in 2001, I, I got to go to England and Scotland to go to a family wedding. And I went to uh, the, the castle of Edinburgh. And that is where the stone of scone, the stone of destiny, Jacob's stone that we're gonna learn about here, um, was housed at the time. And so I got to see it. At the time, it was lost on me, the significance of and the, how, how precious it was to be able to see this, this stone where Jacob had laid his head. And so anyway, um, that's some background um, from the book. But um, physically, in order to do this, Jesus needed to be a descendant of David. And in Luke 3.31, the New Testament shows that Jesus was a descendant of David. So we know that most Christians know that, obviously, right? Um, the prophecies related to the throne of David. King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. Hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter the gates. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Okay, so I want to pause a minute, and I go into this in great detail, that so many times in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, there's a uh, um, distinction made between Judah and the house of Israel. Or Judah was a part of the southern kingdom, which really encompassed the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and some of the Levites. And then there were the northern kingdom, which was the other kind of the other 10 tribes, okay, which included Ephraim and Manasseh, um, Joseph's two sons. And so 
um, when you hear about the house of Israel, it's really referring to the Northern kingdom. And, um, just, you know, super briefly, it's that we know that there were 12 tribes and they were together as one kingdom and in the time of David and the time of Solomon. And then there was this, you know, a number of descendants of, um, Solomon that were corrupt and this falling away, this breaking up of the two kingdoms, the separation of the two kingdoms. Sorry, my nose is itchy. I've got allergies. And um, and so then those, because of the corruption, the Lord allowed their disobedience, the Lord allowed them to be um, to be attacked. And for the northern tribes, the northern kingdom, the house of Israel to be dispersed um, and across the earth. So anyway, lots, lots about that. But that's like just briefly what, what he's talking about here. So the scripture that talks about in Jeremiah 33 David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. So if we can, if we say, you know, God's word does not return void, every word of God will be fulfilled. We believe it or we don't believe it. I believe and I take the Lord at his word. So he's not, you know, here he's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. So to me, that would point us to the understanding that we can look throughout time and look at, you know, has, has there always been a time that a descendant of David has sat on the throne? Um, and, and where, you know, in the book I go into where, you know, where did this house of Israel, where did they go? Where are these people, these lost tribes of Israel, where did they go? And um, the conclusion I, I draw of Manasseh being America and Ephraim being the British Commonwealth of Nations. And so anyway, so that's some background, but let's go on. And, um, it talks about the Levites as well. And then as far as Jesus and that throne goes, notice the following. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from the time forward, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise up, raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. So see, there's, there's two things there. There's Judah and Israel. Now this is his name by which he shall, we will be, he will be called the Lord our righteousness. So we know this is Jesus. Um, and I'm just referencing some notes I made here. So the above passages make clear that the throne of David was to last and that Jesus, though he will sit on it, is not yet doing so. Thus, since scriptures cannot be broken, then someone has to be on that throne now. So that's the conclusion that this author, Dr. Bob Thiel, comes to, and I also agree. Um, someone has had to have been on the throne since the time of Zedekiah, who was a contemporary of Jeremiah, the last king of Judah, and the royalty in the British Isles fits this. Let's, let me also state that there has been Levites ever since Jeremiah, and that's this, this part uh, up here that was talking about the Levites lack a man to offer burnt offerings. Uh, the fact that they do not uh, do their original biblical role does not change the fact that they still exist. So notice all, also a prophecy about Jesus on a throne. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. The idea that Jesus would return to the throne of David is not a, a new thing. It's not uh, us, just us folks here in this generation. Um, it's, it is taught in the New Testament. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. So it should be understood that not only is this doctrine about Jesus assuming David's throne in the Bible, the idea that Christ upon his return will take over David's throne. So that says that there would still be a throne. Was believed by those who held too many Church of God doctrines in Transylvania during the late Middle Ages. So... This is um, speaking about 1588 to 1623, where these, you know, some of this literature has been recorded. Some of these the beliefs have been recorded. Germany, 1894. There are reports about an object that may have traveled to Ireland and then Scotland. Ancient Irish legends recount that in addition to the king's daughters, Jeremiah brought with him some national treasures from the temple. So first, I want to point out the daughters, that the descendants could be daughters and that some national treasures. The most important of these was the Leah Fail, or Stone of Destiny, Jacob's Stone. 
The Bible relates that Jacob, the forefather of the Israelite tribe, set up a stone pillar after making a covenant with God. It was also a custom in ancient Israel to crown kings over a stone. The stone was later taken to Scotland by King Fergus and then to England. It has been used in all three countries for the coronation of monarchs following the ancient Israelite custom. Those of us with backgrounds in the old WCG basically believe that there is a connection between the old throne of Israel and the current throne of the British royal family. Whether or not it's the same stone has been questioned, however. So there's, you know, the, the has anyone proved that it is the same stone? But I'll tell you, I believe in my heart that it is. So we all, we all get to ask the Lord for ourselves. Um, let's see. I just, um, there's so much really, really good stuff here. Uh, that I want to be sure that I, I'm getting into. So, um, yeah, I do think I want to cover this. So we we have seen a late work on prophecy, gravely affirming that the prophet Jeremiah died in Ireland, having been forced hither by the wandering sons of Ephraim. One of the few unquestionable facts connected with early Irish history is the intercourse between Ireland and the Phoenicians through Spain. Okay, so I want to pause there a second and say that I've, as I was writing this book and after I was done writing it, um, the Lord has connected me with some other folks who have studied out the, this connection of the lost tribes of Israel and where did they go and who are they as people. And so one of those authors, I'm going to just pull this up here a second, um, is a man named Dan Griffey. And so I've gotten a chance to talk with him and some of the people that are close to him. And so he's written some tremendous books and which I've read and I would highly recommend to you. So World War III and Prophecy, Second Moses, Second Exodus, Zion, the Antichrist. Um, and so in those books, um, in one of the books specifically, he really uh, he goes into some detail about um, the Phoenicians. And let me look a second. Um, yeah, so then there's another author. I haven't met this author in person, but this was connected. So let's see if you can see this a second. Let me see. Make this a little bit bigger. So Israel's tribes today, Stephen N. Collins. And then Israel's lost empires. So just let you see that a minute. So in this book, um, there's just uh, so much history and so many resources given that demonstrate the connection between who the Phoenician people really were. And so anyway, I just want to point that out because uh, that was a good tie in to this. OK, so the Phoenicians um, and, and that they really were. Israelites, um, wandering Israelites. So through Spain, the Israelite settlers, according to the tradition, carried with them Jacob's pillow or pillar known as the Leophale or stone of destiny, which sec secured a perpetual monarchy to the people so happy as to possess it. The stone at the crowning of the first king of the Scots in Scotland was borrowed. Okay. The above legend is interesting as it may tie Ephraim in with the British Isles and affirms the idea that Jeremiah also came to the Isles. In the 43rd chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is shown to be with the king's daughters. The only two times the expressions, the king's daughters, is used in the Bible, it is in the book written by Jeremiah. These two, two chapters, presuming that Jeremiah took one or more of the king's daughters with him, this would be a way to fulfill the following prophecies. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. I promise David your father saying you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. The Davidic kingdom ended in Judah centuries before Christ came. Okay, so this is a little mini, mini history lesson that's really important to understand and make the connections. Thus, there had to be a way for the descendants of David to rule. And probably prior to the time the last true king of Judah died, his daughters, who seemed to have been in the British Isles, likely married and had descendants to reign. Those who actually believe what the Bible teaches must realize that somehow God must have fulfilled his promises. And the British Isles seemed to make the most historical sense to fulfill this. As well as then there's all this ar archaeological and historical evidence. So here's something that the, the then Duke of York, who later was King George VI of England from uh, 1936 until 1952, reported. I am sure the British Israelite business is true. I've read a lot about it lately and everything, no matter how large or small, points to our being 
Now he says the chosen race. I do not, that's not at all the conclusion that I draw. Um, because we are um, the, you know, the children of God doesn't mean we're the chosen race. God, God has um, a people and, you know, this whole race and all that. I don't, I don't want to go there necessarily, but um, so, so even the last king of England believed in British Israelism. All right. So I will say that um, in the book, I really do try to, to, to handle that topic of um, God created, we are his creation, no matter the color of our skin, um, no matter where we were born, we're his and he loves us. And Jesus came to save all men, to save all people, to bring all people to himself. Now we have a choice to make whether we do that. But there is in God's story, his plan, there was a people, Israel. And the purpose of having a people was that they were to demonstrate, like be a reflection of who their God was, to bring their God to others, right? And so that's I'm going to be my interpretation of that. All right. So even the last king of England believed in British Israelism. Okay, so notice the following. So this was from a ceremony, a recorded coronation, um, this specific, the 10th century, that was that used the Stone of Destiny in the coronation ceremony. This is what they recorded. And then this author added the scriptures for where the reference is. Here he shall be anointed with oil, and this anthem shall be sung. And Zodak the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king in Zion, and approaching him they said, May the king live forever. The scepter shall be given him, given here, be here, sorry, the scepter shall be here given to him. The rod shall be here given to him. And he who is the king of key of David, and the scepter of the house of Israel, who opens and no one can shut, and shuts and no one can open, may he be thy helper. So you can't help but see the scripture in this this text that was taken from the coronation ceremony where the stone was used. So the ancient kings of Israel were anointed with oil. Scepters were long recognized in the Bible as a symbol for ruling. The key of David is mentioned in both the Hebrew and the Greek, Greek scriptures. Having all these as part of a coronation ceremony may be more than coincidence or simple imitation of what some later saw in the Bible. So the conclusion you could draw is that these were, you know, Israelites who many, you know, this is, um, goodness, many years later, what, I, don't, I lost the timing of when this said this was recorded, um, the late 10th century, you know, so a thousand years uh, after Jesus and a thousand years ago from us, right, this is the wording that they were using. So this sure sounds like um, they're talking about their heritage. Um, as it turns out, it has been asserted that the stone is in the British Isles and has ancient biblical connections. And so um, I don't think I'm going to go into this tonight, but I really would encourage you to read Genesis 28, 11 to 22, where we read about Jacob, tired after miles of walking, stopped for the night and took one of the stones to serve as his pillow. After dreaming in his sleep, Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it up for a pillar and poured poured oil upon the top of it. Okay. And so this is the stone of scone, um, having been anointed. Ha the same rock, the coronation stone, accompanied the Israelites during their 40 years wandering in the wilderness. So again, you know, keep in mind how, how much longer, how, um, how much time had gone by when that was. Um, because you had Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then Jacob had his 12 sons and Joseph, you know, went into Egypt and was used to save his, his brothers. And then they stayed there 433 years. And then they wandered in the desert for 40 years. So the stone stayed with them a long time. Um, during those 40 years, the stone accompanied Israel. That is undoubtedly why the two iron rings fastened to either end are so worn. The stone and its rings could never have become worn by lying untouched in England's Westminster or Scotland's scone or in the halls of Tara in Ireland, because that's also where, where it was. It's reported to have been with um, the, the, the king's daughters. It must have been worn during the wilderness wanderings. As this stone is used in the coronation ceremonies to this day, and for us, now that, that the queen has passed away and King Charles, it looks like 
Um, and I don't want to presume on the Lord and we'll see what happens between now and his coronation. Um, you know, whether he does reign or something else happens. Um, but at his coronation, this stone would be used. Um, let's turn to a scripture which proves that this pillar stone was used in the family of David in the days of ancient Israel. So 2 Kings eleven fourteen. This event mentioned here occurred at the time when Josiah was proclaimed king in the temple and when wicked Athaliah, who had usurped the throne, was about to meet her doom. Notice what it says. And when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, what? The king stood by a pillar as the manor was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew their trumpets. Okay, so the author is saying that, that the belief is that this pillar really is the, the stone of destiny. And so in this story in Second Kings, we see how the the um, the daughter of King Joram took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away. So basically, you know, there were underhanded things happening, and Athelia tore her clothes and cried out, treason, treason. Um, so it was the manner or custom, even in that day, to have the pillar of stone, Jacob's pillar stone, used in the coronation ceremonies. But how did that stone finally reach London, England, where it may be seen today. So in this time when this author was wrote this article, the stone was still in England. Um, but in 1996, it was moved to uh, the Edinburgh Castle, which is then where I saw it in 2001. The world today in its ignorance looks upon any government or throne or as deriving its power from human authority, little realizing that it is God who sets up rulers and who breaks down thrones. Almost 3,000 years ago, God made an amazing promise whereby David's dynasty which would continue ruling through all generations and that he would never lack an individual to reign upon his throne. I have sworn upon my servant David, thy seed will I establish forever and build upon thy throne to all generations." David shall never want a man to sit on the throne of the home of Israel. Notice it reads house of Israel, not house of Judah. And I've already talked about that. Um, remember that after the days of Solomon, the children of Israel were divided into two houses, the house of Judah and the house of Israel. The throne of David ruled in the house of Judah until the days of Zedekiah. When the throne of David apparently was at an end, God caused the prophet Jeremiah to take King Zedekiah's daughters and Jacob's pillar stone with him to transplant them the stone of David from Judah to the house of Israel, where Jacob prophesied the stone of destiny would be found in our day. And so we believe that it has. Um, Jacob said that the stone which he anointed would be a pillar, a witness, proving which is the house, the nation, the royal family that God has chosen. The stone is found today in, actually, Edinburgh. The world may scoff and sneer at the truth. The world may deny the facts of history, but Queen Elizabeth, and soon to be King Charles, is is was ruling over part of Israel, the tribe of Ephraim. She sits upon the throne of David, the very throne that Jesus Christ shall take when he returns to the world. And the Lord shall give unto him Jesus, the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. <sighs> yes, on the throne of England reigns a daughter of David, a descendant of King Zedekiah's daughter, whom Jeremiah the prophet took to Ireland together with the stone of destiny. From the marriage of that young princess was descended a dynasty that has ruled Ireland, Scotland, and England, and many other countries and, and lands for over 2,500 years, and all of them have been crowned over the, over, um, the same stone of destiny, Jacob's Pillow. So I don't think that picture didn't come through there. Um, all right, I think that's where I'm going to end this video. Um, I think in the next video, I'm going to, to continue on because you might be asking, you know, to, to understand more about this, um, this daughter of the king, the, the princess T. Teffy. And so I think this is just really, really interesting um, information in the biblical history of it and then other recorded history of, of what happened, what was God's plan with Tefi, and how could the royal blood of David still be reigning over um, the house of Israel, Ephraim, even to this day. All right, thanks so much for watching.